Hello, everyone. Um, it's a really great honor to present um, to you today the history of the Calaveras uh, County Historical Society. Um, as I have found it um, in my first year um, being your uh, director of the, of, of the society and the county museums. Um, um, I'd like to be transparent about the fact that I'm new to the county and I've only lived here since 2019. And I'm sure folks here might have a lot more authority um, to just, uh, with the topic that I'm going to discuss. Um, so I'm just hoping you won't throw cupcakes at me if I get some names wrong or <laughs> derail on some facts. And feel free to stop me if, if you need to. Um, all right. So here we go. Now, so here I am on my first day of work at CCHS. Um, when I took on the position of director, um, I realized I was up against a very big problem. And I, I found amazing people that were working hard on the board and a long legacy of documented history in Las Calaveras and two museums that were literally packed with artifacts. But what was missing was a history of how it had all come to be. Um, and it became obvious to me that the organization had done such a great job of documenting the history of the county that the members who had propelled the project forward all those decades had not documented their own history. So that's where this presentation comes from, because I'm the one there and I'm digging through all the archives and I've, I've found a lot of this history and I think you'll find it just as interesting as I do and maybe you know everything that I'm going to say. I hope that I'll be able to tell you something new. <laughs> All right. Um, and I, I, I would like to say, um, before I get going, and this has gone on a while, um, that it's really incredible to be a transplant to this county and to be embraced by so many people in this community. I don't think anybody else really has that experience, and, and it's just wonderful to be welcomed by you all. <laughs> All right, so where do we start? We start at the beginning. Now, I was at the Red Barn in deep storage, as I call it, and I came across this in a random box, and this is the minutes for the Historical Society between 1952 and 1964, and I've been mining this um, for great information and facts about how everything came to be. Um, now, what I have done here is I was able to find the notes from the very first meeting to discuss the possibility of organizing a historical society um, in May of 1952. And in this, um, there's a really awesome proposal about the intentions of the society and what people then really wanted to see this turn into. And so what I've done here is I've gone through and looked at all of those points and weighed them against whether we've accomplished these things that were set down for us. So th that's the overall theme of this uh, presentation here. Okay. So according to these notes, on Wednesday, May 22nd, 1952, an interested group led by Dr. Richard Cope Wood and fostered by the Calaveras Grange met in the library of the Calaveras Union High School for the purpose of discussing the formation of a Calaveras County Historical Society. So there it is, or maybe I should say the first of many meetings of CCHS. Of note here is that the Calaveras Grange, number 715, was the parent organization of CCHS. Now, according to Lynn Norfolk, who helped me with these details, uh, the Grange was formed in 1944, and by 1952, at the time of this first meeting of, of CCHS, it was a very active organization in the county that served um, through various programs <laughs> to uh, support the community in general and at large. Many of the original members of CCHS were also members of the Grange. It was decided at this meeting that until the organization got on its own feet, the Grange would support it. 
There was also an important stipulation that CCHS would not be a Grange project, but be allowed to develop itself as its own entity, and this is essential. Now, the original members that were present, and this is where I might butcher some names, I'm very sorry, were Mr. and Mrs. Elgin Hiddle, okay, huh? Hittell, thank you, Kenny. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Percy Hunt, Mr. George B. Poor Jr., Mr. John Squilotti, yeah. uh, Mrs. Edward Howard, Mr. and Mrs. A Amon Tanner, okay, Amon, Mr. and Mrs. Amon Tanner, uh, Mrs. Wilbur Kelling, Dr. Wood, and his invited guest, Mr. Covert Martin of Stockton. Now, what a great cast of characters to open this story. I, I think one of the first things to be seen here is that this was by no means a man-only organization. Men and women are present in the first meeting equally. This is worth noting because this precedent of equal gender opportunity in the organization would carry through to the present day. Um, many of the names previously mentioned are families that endure in the county to this present day. I know we have a table of tanners was a, a non a, a tanner that's related to you guys? Okay, see, you guys know everything. Okay, so now there are two members in that phrase that stand out. Okay, so many of you know this face, or at least this man's work um, very well. Um, this is um, Dr. Richard Coke Wood. Um, Dr. Wood wrote many books on the subject of the county, such as The Land of Skulls and Murphy's Queen of the Sierra, to name a few. And also Ken Snyder brought one of his books for us to look at over there on the little pop-up museum over there. Um, he was also instrumental in the founding um, and was very active in the first decades of CCHS. Um, interesting to note is that he brought with him a guest to this first meeting, a man named Covert Martin of Stockton. Although I could not find a photo of him, I was able to find out that his full name was Asa Van Covert Martin, and he was born in 1885 and died in 1962, and he was a photographer and a historian out of Stockton. Now, this is one of his photographs of Stockton, and it's the home of, of Dr. Clark. Um, Martin co-authored a book about Stockton with Dr. Wood. The two men were friends, and it would appear that Mr. Martin was the one that inspired Dr. Wood to start the Historical Society, as Mr. Martin had founded a historical society um, for San Joaquin County. Now, during the first meeting um, of the CCHS, Mr. Martin was very helpful in giving advice uh, for how to start CCHS, and he is worth mentioning because although he was a visitor um, and didn't come from the county, the society may not have been formed without him. So it's an important little tidbit. Okay, many of you know this face. Many of you know this man. <laughs> um, George Poor is fundamental. <laughs> I'll just say it again. George Poor is fundamental. <laughs> Yes, um, many people know, uh, knew him, and I've heard many stories um, of him in the society. Um, yes, um, he was the one that organized the first meeting of CCHS, and he would um, continue to be an active member for decades to come. At this first meeting, George's main point was that the society should be open to anyone who was interested and willing to lend support. He pointed out that many historical groups at the time were limited to um, pioneers and their descendants. So it was unanimous, unanimously decided that anyone with an interest in perpetuating the history of Calaveras County be allowed to join. Okay, now this is a younger picture of a man that we may all know quite well. Um, this is um, Judge uh, Smith. Um, James Alexander Smith, known by, uh, as Alex by um, those close to him, he was extremely important to the founding of CCHS. He didn't attend, attend the first meeting, though, because he was working, but he was there for the second, and it was by the third meeting that he was elected as the first president of the society. 
Judge Smith wrote many articles and kept extensive notebooks on the county history, which are now in the collection of the society, having been donated recently by the Harpers. Um, let's see. Um, he was a wealth of knowledge unlike none other, and he remained the society's president for 10 years. The longest run for a president outside of Donna Shannon and Rourke Weber, who both served four years. Bless your heart. We will discuss the Judge Smith's dedication and, and um, contributions as we go through the presentation. Um, okay, so much of the rest of the meeting was just business. And any of us who have sat through a board meeting know that I don't need to go into the business. Um, so they, they set about um, creating the bylaws and, um, and they created various committees that we still follow today. Um, what I find to be very important from this first meeting is that those present set down the intentions of the society in very specific terms, which I feel are worth going over here and looking at in a broader sense of the long history of the society. It can be seen from this first decade of the society that just about every purpose, mission, and project was laid down by the groundwork of these um, original members. Um, to go through all of these accomplishments would be impossible because I'm trying to keep this to a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to leave many things and people out, but I will do my best to connect these early intentions to the projects that have come to pass over the last 70 years. <sighs> it's not going to be that bad, I promise. Okay, so number one of these um, first intentions, to revere, honor, and perpetuate the memory of the pioneers and early settlers of California, and especially Calaveras County. All right, so I'm going to look at this and see the ways that we've fulfilled this um, in each of these. So this is a lovely picture of um, Lost City um, that I particularly love. Um, to understand why they put this down first, we have to think about the state of things when uh, the, it was set down in 1952. The county's historical places and monuments at the time were for the most part in a shambles or on the brink of shambles. The work they were setting out to do was not immediately understood by the community at large. Um, today we have more appreciation for antiquity, but then it was all about doing away with the old to create space for the new. Um, there had been little work done on the history of the county, uh, much, less than the pres much less the preservation of that history. We didn't have the monuments we have now. None of the sites had been put on the National Register. The National Register didn't exist. And it would be many more decades until Judith Marvin, who's here, <laughs> hi Judith, <laughs> entered the picture and added so many of our resources to these registers that protect them. So let's look at some of the ways that they accomplish this. There are many ways in which the memory of the early pioneers um, uh, uh, and their memory was perpetuated. One of the most important was the collection of photographs. Now, this is why CCHS has such an extensive photo collection, and you guys are always welcome to join me to go through these photos. They're wonderful. Just come down to the office. I'm there 10 to 4 every day. Um, in the first years of the society, many people came to donate the images of their relatives to be protected and to document their family's pioneer history. Now, another way... Um, that this was accomplished was through locating and preserving cemeteries in the county. Now, the cemeteries in the 50s were in bad disrepair, and many had been trampled by cattle for years and almost rubbed off the map. Now, there are many instances in the early days of the society where committees were formed to find the cemeteries and to put up fences and rock walls to secure them. Now, oops. Um, this work continues today, um, as the current board of CCHS has been working to help preserve the Popper Cemetery um, that was uh, part of the old county hospital, um, which many of you know um, stood on the site 
of um, where the government center is now. And this pauper cemetery is right above the library. And CCHS has been working to put a fence around it and put a new gate. So these are really important things that continue today. Now, so I'm gonna talk a bit about Judge Smith. Um, another method of honoring this first intention can be seen clearly in the work of Judge Smith. Smith preserved many of the sites that he knew were going to ruin with his camera. We have his cameras at the museum too, if you'd like to see them, they're wonderful. Um, he was very aware of what I call a myth of progress. And I'm talking to the historical society, you're going to understand what I mean. Um, it's the idea um, that, that we're gonna move everything out of the way for things that are new. Um, and, and this is important to the pioneer history um, because it was all of that history was soon lost um, um, for the favor of new buildings, new land claims, new, 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 new. He was very aware of the threat to historic buildings that projects such as the widening of the highway in San Andreas would cause, and he set out, in what must have been his little or no free time, to document these places and buildings through photographs. And I've put together here some of my favorites. So here's the old Masonic Hall at Campus Seiko. Just beautiful, he was an amazing photographer. So here's St. Charles Street looking easterly, a view that we don't have anymore because both sides were completely demolished. But Judge Smith went out there and he knew that was gonna happen and he just took pictures. So this is the racetrack in San Andreas. I think many, maybe some of you recognize this. Um, I may have this wrong, but I believe it's out behind Oak's Shadows and at the end of the old airport. And if you go out there, you can see the, the sunken land there. I'm getting nods, so I, I'm probably right. But this is this is a great, great photo. Um, here's another view of Mountain Ranch that maybe we don't see um, anymore. I think this is the the hotel there, and probably to um, the right would be where the post office is now. And then this is Main Street, looking uh, south, so up towards where we are now. And there's this great picture of when um, the Chamber of Commerce and the museum um, and uh, help me, the library, library. We're all together there um, on the left. And the Freeburger building is gone. See how much I've learned in a year? Just saying. <laughs> and then here's a picture of donkeys just because it's the 20 minute lull <laughs> and I thought you needed some donkeys. <laughs> all right. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so who recognizes this? Thank you, Bonnie. Yes. What's that? Oh, wow. You yeah, can swim over it now. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Okay, so. Why do I have this here? So this was the first major project for preservation and the saving of historical places. And it was a campaign led by CCHS to halt the destruction of the, of the, of the covered bridge. Um, this was really the first one. So Archie Stevenow, then a resident of Tuolumne County, brought the issue to CCHS in July of 1953. It was a topic for years. And CCHS led a good fight to save the bridge based on community action through public awareness and by petitioning the supervisors of Calaveras and Tuolumne counties. The bridge was significant in that it was one of the few remaining covered bridges in California. Dr. Wood in his book on the subject calls the bridge's site the lonely and picturesque road from Copperopolis to Sonora. That's just poetry. Um, I'm trying to date this photo, if anybody could date it by the car. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that seems right on the money, because these were um, donated from the Nielsen estate 
Um, yeah, that makes complete sense, thank you. Um, the problem was that there was a tri-dam project that would cause the side of the bridge to be inundated by the waters of the Tullock Reservoir. There was a great movement around the project and news of the bridge's impending demise was distributed throughout the state and many campaigned to save it, but by, no by November 1957, the bridge was gone. We don't always win. And I just love this photo from the Nielsen estate of the demolition. You can almost see the bridge trembling in the background there. <laughs> now, this is interesting. So this is one of the objects I found at the museum. Um, th this is a gavel made from the wood of the bridge um, by Archie Stevenau and presented to the Historical Society, which is just poetic justice and probably a real kind of like, ah, well, here we go, guys. <laughs> okay, so next, number two. To study the history of California and especially Calaveras County, and number three, to encourage and develop the facilities for the study of California history. Now, um, what I have here, does anybody recognize? I mean, I, I know it's written there at the bottom, but this, <laughs> this was the state of the, of the uh, Double Springs Courthouse in the time of Judge Smith. So you can almost imagine what it looked like when members of the society approached it in the 2000s, Wally, 2000s? All right. Um, so, um, yes. Um, okay. So the courthouse was the first in the county and it was made of fabricated pieces that were comprised of camphor wood and shipped from China and then packed to Double Springs from San Francisco and built there. Now, um, the courthouse was rescued by the society and reassembled in the downtown museum. Um, the courthouse is important to a broader understanding of California history as it figures into how laws were set up and enacted in places that before had no such laws or due processes. I wanted to put this one in because we won. And I believe that this was a project spearheaded by Wally Motlock. <laughs> Guilty, yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes, and anytime you wanna come visit it, members get in free. So another great program um, started by CCHS was the high school essay contest. And I'm sure that many people in the room submitted essays um, to this cause, yeah. This was begun in 1961 and went on for over 40 years and we're currently discussing starting it up again. Um, much of the history was preserved this way as many times the teachers would pair their students with old timers um, that they interviewed about their topics. Um, these essays are, all of them, are still in the collection of CCHS and um, many are the only documentation of various details of the county's history. I'm flipping through them now. I know you guys are getting tired. <laughs> um, so number four, to secure documents and articles of historical interest and to provide facilities for their care, protection and safeguarding. Now, I didn't really just wanna give you an image of, of the office. So this is Shannon Van Zandt at the right and Kate Culver here at the left. They, uh, Shannon Van Zandt is the county archivist and Kate Culver is the one who organized all of the wealth of information that we have in the office today, all the family files. And she was on the, on the tail of Lorraine Kennedy. Um, now, at the office in San Andreas, this has definitely come to fruition. We have um, there stored with care a mass of files, binders, scrapbooks, photographs pertaining to the history of the county. There is also a collection of unpublished manuscripts that I do hope to see in print someday. It should be stated here that this particular intention is served now primarily by the county archives, which is supported by CCHS's sister organization, the Calaveras Heritage Council, which was formed in 1976, where the society keeps a general history of the county. The archives holds the specifics. 
Um, Shannon Van Zandt, the county archivist, has been extremely helpful in my finding uh, the history out and, and um, in understanding the relationship of the various historical institutions in the county. Okay, so Los Calaveras. <laughs> you gotta be proud of this. Um, here, um, also under the heading of securing documents and articles of interest, we see the emergence of Los Calaveras. It was decided that year in 1952, just five months later after the formation of the society, um, that they would produce a bulletin that functioned to document and disseminate the history of the county, and Los Calaveras was born. How fantastic it is to consider that since its inception, it has run uninterrupted four times a year for 70 years. Maybe not always right on time, <laughs> but coming out four times a year. <laughs> so that's about 280 issues now. Um, and, and the, oh, I get to that, sorry, mm, excuse me. <laughs> And there, there were many, many amazing editors over the years. So here we have George, um, George Hoper? Hooper. See, I don't know much about this man. Um, if anyone would like to enlighten me about him, I would love to learn. Um, but I do know about the man, the other man in this image, um, Willard Fuller. Willard Fuller is also fundamental. <laughs> yes, um, both of them devoted uh, all of their time um, to uh, the editing of Los Calaveras. Now, along with this, I'm wondering if any of you have seen this. This is the diary of Thomas Jefferson Madison, um, Calaveras pioneer. Okay. Um, so this was the very first publication project of CCHS, and it's... Um, um, the Diary of Thomas Jefferson Madison Calaveras Pioneer. Um, the, the diary was first brought to the attention of the society by Dr. Wood in June of 1952. Um, so this is um, Madison. He's the little boy on the bike in this photo. <laughs> this is just darling. Um, and the diary consists of Madison's trip from New York around the Horn and into Calaveras where he settled in Murphy's. Um, he had a very interesting and full life. After trying his luck at mining, he then started a stage business and took the mail along the Big Trees route and also provided tourist transportation from Murphy's to Big Trees as well as other destinations. It's a really fabulous story and you're welcome to come read it. You can't check it out though, I'm sorry. We only have one. <laughs> All right. So Los Calaveras and this first publication were of extreme importance to the early members of the society for they were trying to fill a void of the lack of written documentation of the history of the county. Yes, okay. This is, there, there isn't many more. So number five, to help maintain a museum. Now. I really like how this is phrased, to help maintain a museum. I feel like this implies that a museum is a community endeavor, but it also accounts for the current status of our county museums. Many people don't realize that the county museums and CCHS um, are separate entities. Um, CCHS is contracted to operate the county museum for the county itself. Um, they own the buildings and much of the collection of artifacts which has been in care of the county archives until recently. Now, um, but the first museum in, in the eyes of those who wrote this was actually in this building. Um, many people here may remember that the museum, the library, and the chamber of commerce are all part of the same building in the old American restaurant on Main Street in San Andreas. Um, one of the first big brick buildings, and which is now the county archives. The museum at the time featured objects from the collection of Desiree Frico and others that lived in Frico City. Desiree Frico bought the building and donated it for the use of the community inspired, and inspired the first museum. In 1967, the museum was moved to its current place. Um, when the new government center was built, um, the old courthouse and hall of records went derelict 
um, for a time. And they were actually, our old courthouse and the Hall of Records were slated for demolition. Um, they wanted parking. Yeah. Uh, it makes me a little sad. Um, <laughs> but George Poor steps in. Yay, George. <laughs> and George stepped in and saved them. And um, he found a way to convince the supervisors to allow the space to be used for the museum. Um, and he definitely came through with this intention to help maintain a museum. He was also the first person in my position. And after the remodel, it was Judith Marvin. Um, now, um, Judith um, implemented the wonderful permanent displays that are still currently featured. Um, I am very much part of a long legacy, and it gives me much pride to be counted among such powerhouses of museumness. I really didn't know how else to say it. <laughs> it was also Judith who brought out the story of the Miwok and made a place for the story in the museum. Um, building a relationship with Native people uh, was of great importance in the early days of the Historical Society. And the original members of CCHS worked closely with Chief Fuller and helped him to document his life as well as the language and traditions of his people. Finally, and yes, we've come to the end. <laughs> um, I hope it wasn't too excruciating. Um, um, we come to the final intention from that first meeting of CCHS in 1952. To develop the love of community. That's just wonderful. Um, county, state, and nation in the state of California and especially among the youth thereof. Now, um, I feel that um, I shouldn't have said that, sorry. I blew that. Um, so included in this statement, I feel, are all of your wonderful faces um, that have attended these dinner meetings for, for the years. Um, it, they've been doing the dinner meetings actually for 70 years. The first one was held in Murphy's. So we're a continuing tradition. Um, and um, I put this picture of Tad Fallendorf and Don Cuneo um, because I'm not sure which, but they might be the longest um, members in good standing. <laughs> yeah. And they'll have to fight that one out because I, I've tried, I can't find the facts. Um, now, I feel that the best example um, of this intention in our current times and piggybacking off the need to help maintain a museum is the Red Barn Museum Project. Now, what an exercise in community this was and is. So many people, including a good number in this room, came together to develop the Red Barn Museum, and I'm just going to have to run off some names here. David Studley, uh, Donna Shannon. Um, um, here's some, some photos of, of people working. You may recognize them. And does anybody recognize this dilapidated object? Is it? <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought it was the milk wagon. <laughs> well, I blew that one. <laughs> and I also outed myself as not knowing what a manure spreader looks like. But we'll skip it. Here's, here's, here's another wonderful picture of, of, of one of the first dinner meetings in the annex. And we absolutely have to mention um, Rosemary Faulkner. And I just, go ahead, applause. <laughs> I went through a lot of pictures of Rosemary and this was my favorite. She's got her tape measure and she's ready to take on the world. <laughs> yes. Um, so just to say some other names, um, the Wagners who also helped a great deal with the barn, um, the Respis, um, who come to every volunteer cleanup, um, Beverly Burton, who I just have to say, 
Beverly Burton, I wrote here, is a CCHS matriarch. <laughs> and we also must mention Phil Alberts and many others that are not here in person, but also many that are not here but are with us in spirit, such as Dwayne Wright and Eden Sanders. Now, um, and also Gary Hurd. <laughs> If I had a half an hour to sing his praises, I would. <laughs> but this man is also fundamental. Um, I think he's devoted 20 years or more of his life to this organization. And um, I had to give him his own space here. Um, and then this man at the bottom. Um, above all, we must mention Dave Sanders who has been an unspoken, or maybe overtly spoken, I'm not sure which, backbone of the project to its present day. You really should see what this man has going on out there, and he needs help. Please help him. He's going to get hurt. <laughs> I've recently started calling the outside of the Red Barn Dave's Playground. <laughs> but yes, OK. So. In summation, I'd just like to say that um, y'all are amazing. And CCHS should be very proud of its work um, uh, over the last 70 years. Um, and, and we want to stay true to these original intentions that were set down at the first meeting at the high school in May of 1952. I think everyone who is a member should have great pride in the legacy that we are a part of and I encourage all of you to participate in this mission that was set down by these founding members. Here's to another 70 years of CCHS.